Good evening, Smith Memorial, and welcome to the service of worship. Thank you for joining me this evening. It's Holy Wednesday. It's the fourth day of the week. It's the third day of our special evening worship services as we continue to follow together Jesus' journey from the triumph of Palm Sunday to the cross of Good Friday and eventually, of course, to the resurrection of Easter Sunday. On Sunday, we welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem, but we did so with an eye towards what's coming. And then on Monday, we braced ourselves for all that is in store for Jesus. Yesterday, we talked about the villain in the story. This is, after all, a big, epic, incredible story that we all have been drawn to and that we all have placed our faith in its authenticity and its truthfulness. So we began, by, we began looking at the villain. And we looked inward and we understood that maybe we, as human beings, play a role in this somehow. There's something about being human that makes the story of Holy Week necessary. Today we're going to look at evil from a slightly different lens. We're going to look at evil and understand that there's something dark that's at play in Jesus' story. Something that goes beyond us and something that does in some way or another lead Jesus to the cross. It's a heavy topic, but it's an important topic, and it's one that we need to understand as Christians as we try to make sense of how to live in this complicated and crazy and confusing world of ours. So I invite you to get comfortable. I invite you to join me again for worship. Thank you for being here. I invite you to get cozy, and I invite you to prepare your heart and your mind as we together worship our God. And now, friends, let us go to God for a word of prayer as we begin our time together. My divine Lord, you and you alone must become the focus of my life. You and you alone are of the greatest value in life. Help me to shed all earthly desires in life so that I will not fall into the temptations that lead to empty promises and so that I will embrace the true and fulfilling promises that come from you. Jesus, I trust in you. Amen. Our scripture for today comes from the 22nd chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. I'll be reading to you from verses 3 through 6. Listen now for the word of God. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Friends, this is the word of God for us all, the people of God. There was a night during my hospital chaplaincy internship that we had a patient flown in by helicopter. If you haven't heard me speak about this before, I was a chaplain intern at a children's hospital in Atlanta in the spring of 2019. Um, working in a children's hospital was never easy, but there were some nights that were worse than other nights, and this was one of those nights. I had been assigned to cover the building to be on call for any emergencies that might come up over the course of that evening. And that evening we had a pretty bad one come through. This child had gotten, had gotten sick very suddenly and had been flown in over the course of the evening for what everyone hoped would be life-saving treatment. I met the parents and they were of course very badly shaken. I went away for a little while, let them, got, let them get settled in, and then went off to go eat some dinner. A few, probably a couple hours later, I was called back to the room and got some really bad news from the parents. They told me that the doctors had just explained that their child would not survive the night. 
I spent most of the evening in that one room with that family. Family and friends of the parents came in, came and went throughout the evening. They trickled in and they trickled out, trying to offer support as best they could. Numbers and on monitors got lower. Prayers went up. Tears fell down. And the whole evening, the whole night into the morning passed with an incredible sense of sorrow because this was not supposed to happen. The child, who still had a full life to live, was deprived of that life died that night. But I remember a few hours before thinking to myself, God, why are you letting this happen? Why are you letting this happen? I'd been through school, I'd been in church since I was little, and there was no theological explanation that I could come up with. There still is no theological explanation that I can come up with for why these things are allowed to happen. There's still not a satisfactory one that I can think of. I do have to tell you, though, that in the next breath, literally the next instant, I got hit with this sense that I can't really explain, but I got hit with this sense that God had definitely not caused this. That there was something else going on here. There was something that went beyond the medical or the biological. I don't know what it was. I couldn't tell you what it was. What I can tell you is that something dark was in that room. Something beyond my ability to comprehend or to control. Something beyond any of our abilities to comprehend or to control. The doctors told one story, and certainly their story was a correct story, but it was not the whole truth. Because something much more dangerous was at work. People have, for generations, tried to make sense of why bad things happen in our world, and we have yet to come up with an answer that everyone can agree to. We've created wicked anti-gods, devils, who seek nothing but to cause chaos and misery for all people. We have tried to pass off the bad things that happen to people as purely the responsibility of individuals. Those people should act better or else bad things wouldn't happen to them. Those people should stop doing bad things to other people. Evil is just a human problem in this view. We've expanded and we've constricted the legal definition of bad behavior. We've rooted the, the, our understanding of bad behavior in psychology to try to understand the way the brain works. We've spent all this time and come up with all these different ways of looking at the problem. And yet we have not come to an agreement on what evil really is. For all of our attempts to define it, evil remains a mystery to us. Case in point, one of the characters in our passage for today. When you hear the word Satan, do you picture a man with, cr with crimson skin and cloven hoofs and goat horns on his head? Do you think of something different, perhaps? Or do you just have no earthly idea how to picture this thing that corrupts Judas? For my part, I have to tell you that when I think of evil in the abstract and this vague and nebulous and confusing and kind of frightening way. I am actually reminded of Moses' word, or God's words rather, to Moses at the burning bush. God says to Moses, I am that I am. When God is asked to offer a name. Simply put, God is God. 
That's about as much as we as believers can know for certain. God is God. That's it. So I feel like if we're going to look at that which is the opposite of God, then perhaps all we can say with certainty is that evil is evil. It just is. It can't be defined. It can't be understood. It can't be comprehended. It just exists. And it is doing a number on us here on planet Earth. We live in a moment where condemnation is everywhere you look. It seems these days that it's almost a precondition. If you're going to be a famous person, you need to have some undefensible and unfortunate tweet from 10 years ago lying somewhere out on the internet that paints you as a terrible person. We love to condemn in this current moment. We love to condemn and we love to judge. And yet, we also cannot agree on what is good, on what we are meant to do, on how we are meant to, our li meant to live our lives. If you get down into the weeds on something, on any problem, we have questions that we will end up disagreeing on. Is it better to, to respond to a problem with force or with understanding? Is it better to speak patiently or to boldly act out and get the attention that you need? How much bad behavior can we tolerate in our neighbors? How much bad behavior can we tolerate in ourselves? What is bad behavior? These questions continue to plague us. They are not easily defined, and the proof is that we continue to struggle with them, and we continue to struggle with them because they are still at large in our world. Evil is still at large in our world. But, as much as there is a need for continued discussion, and continued dialogue, and continued understanding, and continued conversation, there remains a need for people who will say, evil is evil. It does need to be understood. And it does need to be defined and categorized as best we can. But above all else, it needs to be responded to. Whatever form it might take, whenever it appears, and however it affects us, it needs to be responded to. If we do not, if we do not respond to this evil, it will be so much easier for it to enter into the minds of others, to poison their relationships, to induce their betrayals, and in the end, to get good people crucified while the guilty run free. But if evil is evil, then the reverse of that statement also remains true. Evil is evil, but God is God. God's light shines in the darkness, friends, and even though our present moment might feel dark, that darkness, nor any darkness, will not overcome God's light. Just as evil is unmeasurable and indefinable, so is the goodness of our God without limits. And the proof will be on display on the cross in a few days. The proof will be in a God who took all the punishment humanity had to offer, all the violence that humanity could muster, all the evil that humanity could sustain, and that God refused to retaliate against us. That God said, I will not repay evil with evil. I will repay evil with love. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. 
That is what being truly committed to true goodness looks like. And surely, friends, if that is the depth that God is willing to go for us, then there must be no question that if God is God and evil is evil, then God will triumph over evil through Jesus. What a friend we have there. Amen. And now, friends, with the confidence of being known and called as the children of God that we all are, let us pray the prayer that Jesus Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of my tone. As thou hast sought, so let me seek thy daring children lost and lone. Oh, strengthen me that while I stand. I thank all of you once again for being here and for spending this time in worship with me and with us. Tomorrow is Monday Thursday, and so there will be a fuller service, a bigger service for you to view. There will also be opportunities to participate in an online communion service over Zoom. I encourage anyone who wants to participate to run out to the store, get their bread, get their grape juice as they need, and to prepare to share communion online in that way. But as we look ahead, let us not rush away from that which we have confronted tonight. Evil is evil. It is real, and it must be opposed. We must do what we can. But as we face off against it, let us remember that we do not do that alone. God is with us, God is God, and God is good. All will be set right. Things might seem dark, and over the next few days, they will look very dark as we follow Jesus' process towards the tomb and his breaking out of it. But the love of God will always stand triumphant. And I continue to believe that there is truly nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord.